Hello everyone and welcome to the 100th live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is an absolute pleasure and privilege to be with you here today and I hope that you are in a celebratory mood because celebrations are definitely due to us. We began this journey back in August 2018, four years ago, and here we are today at the 100th Q&A. Um, we have been uh, kind of going through how much change have we seen over the last four years um, all together, particularly obviously thinking about the pandemic, also Brexit here in the UK, but also lots of other things, the tides of global uh, politics and events and climate change and recent kind of ups and downs. Um, um, a kind of we have seen it all together and through that the kind of constant thread has been our gathering together every so often to enjoy just geeking out about the ancient world and the wonderful things that there are to discover in it and it has been a pleasure and a privilege to be with you um, here for it. Happy 100, says Lorraine. Doesn't time fly? Yes, indeed it does. So it is the 100th Q&A. Um, and as a result, we've taken a, a little look back um, at kind of all the exciting things that we've been doing together uh, uh, through these Q&As over the last couple of years. I'm glad to see Tracy's got her champagne emojis going. I hope that you have a drink in hand. I have a little celebratory kind of espresso uh, kind of with me uh, to keep going. I wouldn't want to be drunk in charge of the Q&A. Hello, Deborah. Hello, Alexis. Yes, a happy 100. Happy 100. Not thankfully 100th birthday quite yet, um, but certainly the 100th Q&A. Now, we should kick off as it is the 100th Q&A with some prizes no costume, says Sarah. Not even a silly hat. Not this time. I have, as I said, I've got my, my, my excitement celebratory red cup here uh, with my little coffee in it to celebrate. But I hope that you guys all have some good costumes, some hats, um, and uh, perhaps a, a stiff drink in your hands as well. Richly deserved all of you indeed. So we're going to do a prize week. It is a prize week. We're going to be looking back over the last couple of Q&As we've done. In fact, we've done one, two, three, four, over four or so Q&As that we've done. And of course, we need to decide on a winner for the best question that we've been able to answer. And they will, as always, get a prize. So I've been looking through uh, the questions that we have been answering over the past couple of months with the Q&As. And there have been some great ones. Uh, we've been talking about LIDAR. We've been talking about philosophy and religion. We've been talking about ancient slavery. We've been talking about prisons. Uh, we've been talking about the Titans, Nectar and Ambrosia, bodybuilders, Kylix and Kylikes for symposiums, uh, problems of, of travelling around the world, and of course also propaganda and fake news, as well as a deep dive into good old Iphigenia in Aulis and amongst other things. Hello, Leanne. Hello, Lucy. Hello, Paul. Hello, Sonia. How Oh, thank you so much, Karen. Hello. Nice to see you all um, indeed. Uh, as, but there has to be a winner. Um, and as a result, the kind of winner for the 100th Q&A prize draw is, drum rolls, Stephanie Kirk for her question about the school of Homer on Ithaca and whether that was set up by Homer himself or the result of followers um, that got us all into this description of kind of, well, is there a Homer problem? Uh, kind of, uh, there might not actually be an individual called Homer, but at least a lot of people, both in the modern world and in antiquity, thought there was enough for uh, rhapsodes and other reciters of epic poetry to call themselves the sons of Homer and start trading on that reputation. So, Stephanie Kirk, thank you so much indeed for opening up a world of both what the ancient world was like and what both the ancient world itself thought the ancient world was like as well as what the modern world thinks the ancient world is like. So Stephanie you get a prize and that can be a copy of Ancient Worlds or it can be a copy of From Democrats to Kings, my kind of earliest book that I published in I want to say 2009 now. God, that feels a long time ago. Uh, or if it's not too late in the year, well, you can have a calendar um, or you can have a book about Introduction to Ancient Greece that's really uh, brilliant for Key Stage 2 and 3 if you've got little ones that you might want to pass your prize on to. So get in touch through the Facebook page or via email michaelscottacademic at gmail.com uh, with an address and what you'd like and we'll get that out to you and also however you would like it dedicated as well indeed. So you are, Stephanie, are our 38th prize winner. So here's a toast to you indeed. And with the help uh, of uh, the fabulous team that helps kind of make sure, keep these Q&As on the road, I'm thinking, talking about you Claire in particular as well as a number of others, we have been able to count up the number of prize winners we've had. So 38th prize winner. 
Prize winner Stephanie is today. But we've also been going back through and counting up the number of questions that we've actually been able to answer live on these Q&As across the 100 Q&As that we've been doing since um, summer 2018. And we have come up with an answer <laughs> which is well over 550 questions have been answered live on the Q&A. And that, of course, is just a snippet of the huge number of questions that you have kindly sent in, uh, many of which decided we haven't been able to get a chance to answer and which sit there um, in the long pile of unanswered questions that I try on occasion to sort of zip through to get a few extra um, in there alongside the new ones that come in every time. Um, so, But we have managed to get through over 550 questions, which I think is absolutely extraordinary, all about the ancient world over our 100 Q&As um, and we've also been doing just a little bit of calculating and totting up about where people have come from uh, as they've tuned into the Q&As. One of the things that always amazes me about these Q&As is that where people are watching from in the world, the different backgrounds that they're watching, educational backgrounds um, but also political backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, um, all coming together over this love of the ancient world. Um, and so we've had people tuning in from uh, the UK, obviously, absolutely, but Australia. We've had a couple of people getting up in the middle of the night, haven't we, to be able to watch live and then a number of people who catch up afterwards. Crete, Romania, uh, from the rest of mainland Greece, from Canada, from the US, from Italy, Belgium, China, the Ukraine, Spain, Austria, Hong Kong, the Czech Republic, Germany, Brazil, Estonia, Russia, Bulgaria, Chile, um, Sicily, Finland, Turkey, Tam Tasmania, Norway, Argentina, Portugal, Poland, Sweden, Denmark, Mexico, Serbia, South Africa, the Netherlands, Pakistan, and not to forget Peru. So there you go. What an extraordinary list of countries from around the world that we have had people tuning into the Q&A from. Alexis says she's watching from Rhodes today, you lucky thing indeed. Um, Utet, lovely to see you from Germany. Thank you so much indeed for being part of this and for your excellent question coming in a couple of weeks ago as well that we were able to answer. So really, it is absolutely wonderful to see such a global audience coming together to really kind of, as one of you have put it in, in a note to me, which I'll be reading out in a second, to geek out about the ancient world, which is by far, of course, the best thing that we could all possibly be doing. So we've talked about our prize winner for this week, uh, Stephanie Kirk, but we've also been bringing together all the different prize winning questions uh, that have won, all those 38 now prize winning questions that have won over the last four years and looking back at some of those prize winning questions. And for me, looking back at them is really interesting because what, what it gives us a sense of is just what this Q&A does so brilliantly in putting forward questions and perspectives about the ancient world that we just normally wouldn't even sort of stop to think about. Um, and it's that that kind of, I think, is the unique kind of selling point, if you like, of this Q&A and the unique service it provides. So I'm thinking in particular, uh, back in December 2018, just after when we were we young Q&A people, uh, Paul Mangan's question that was a winner that month, um, who do you think is the most undervalued person from the ancient world? Who was there to hear that question being asked? Or through into April 2019, we had the young William Robson um, talk about how he'd seen uh, a story that children in ancient Greece had to destroy their toys toys as part of a ceremony to become adults. He was like, is this true? And kind of how does this work? And is he going to have to destroy his toys? I think was the follow on question from that winner back in April 2019. Then through to summer 2019, Sarah Scotty was asking about did people of the classical age speculate on the future? And what did they imagine the future would look like? Sarah, I just, there we go, uh, kind of, uh, you uh, kind of just come on with your comment, um, just as we uh, talked about your question from July 2019. Dial forward to April 2020, as we were all in the midst, absolute midst of the beginnings of the pandemic. Um, and of course, Stefan uh, Sveritsen was saying, we're all stuck at home. It's important to keep calm, stick to the usual routines. What was the typical morning routine of the average ancient or Greek or Roman citizen? What did they wash themselves with? What did they have for breakfast? What was their kind of morning routine? Absolutely getting under the heart of what was it really like to be in the ancient world? July 2020, who can forget this? Chantal de Brion was asking about where the ancient Olympic Games started with homing pigeons. I kept scoffing at this when I first saw this question. I remember it vividly. And then I kind of looked into it. And actually, there's some truth to it, isn't there? Homing pigeons were 
they're all part of the ancient Olympics. You literally learn something new every day. Getting through to December 2020, Leanne Webber and Price was asking about things that are spooky and otherworldly. Yeah, I'd like to know if the ancient Greeks and Romans believed in ghosts, spectres and ghouls. Um, and if they did, what did they think they were and how did they interact? March 2021, did ancient empires have political borders? And if so, what kind of customs and controls were in place? I, I don't think anyone needs any guesses as to what was in the headlines back in March 2021 that was helping us um, start thinking about borders and customs and controls. And we're right back again there again, aren't we, this summer, at least in Britain, and particularly if you're at the port of Dover right now. June 2021, Rupert Thought set the ball rolling on a massive spindle that we all enjoyed, which was about the painting of classical statues that set us off again on a road to discovery of something um, which we don't often think about at all. Who's painting those statues as opposed to sculpting them? October 2021, Rebecca Louise. Um, why does Odysseus look so fat and funny on the cup in the Ashmolean Museum? Absolutely brilliant to look at those Boeotian cups. And again, we're coming up uh, for some reflections because the, Rebecca, what well, it was one of your pupils, wasn't it, who was putting this forward? Um, and kind of, it was they were really, really happy to see that their question had been thought about and answered. And then just in February 2022, again, this kind of lovely way of really poking at the lesser talked about, lesser thought about aspects of the ancient world. February 2022, we had Elizabeth Henriksen asking us about the gesture with the middle finger. And apparently it's mentioned as being done by a pupil to Socrates. Is that possible? And what did it mean? We got ourselves down a very odd rabbit warren indeed, thinking about the comedy of Aristophanes and the sorts of things that people did with their middle fingers. So just that quick review of just the prize winning questions um, over the last four years. Uh, of all those over 550 that we've answered, giving us a sense of what makes this Q&A so great, uh, allowing people to come together and really poke from different unexpected angles and angles that are particularly relevant to us in the modern world uh, because of what's going on around us at one particular time and the other. And, and just asking how did the ancients think about this, react to this, and able to then to factor in that knowledge and thinking to kind of what we are doing in our day-to-day -day lives. Hello, Karen in Miami. Uh, Tracy said, love how we can follow what's been topical since 2018 through the questions. Exactly, absolutely that. The f modern and the ancient world constantly reflecting there at each other. Um, so we've talked about our prize winners, we've talked about our favourite Q&As, we've reflected on the number of questions that we've been able to go through. And, and what I did last time was ask you all to send in a few, a few reflections on what the Q&As have meant to you. Um, over the time that you've been watching with us. Oh, Alexis, I'm sorry that it's not allowing you to kind of listen in in all your glory. It's having a hundredth day hiccup. Um, do hope you can catch up in uh, in due course. Um, but yeah, so we've been thinking about kind of, uh, kind of what the Q&As have, have shown us about our changing interests in both the modern and the ancient world. Um, but what have the Q&As meant to you? And I've been really, really appreciative of some of the thoughts that you've sent in about what it's meant to you. And Becky uh, Tyman got in touch. Uh, and this is, uh, Becky is the teacher uh, of Rebecca Louise, kind of who was the pupil who asked about the fat Odysseus on the Boeotian Cup. Uh, and Becky says this, I'd just like to say that the online sessions have been so useful to actually to share with my students. Um, although you point out that apparently showing them on, on Facebook makes you sound very old, but apparently if you show them on YouTube, you sound very young, cool and hip with the kids. Well done, Becky. Um, a particular highlight was then getting the students to kind of volunteer their own questions that we got through onto the show and then answered. She was so pleased to see that kind of cycle uh, of being actually responded to. It brings a bit of magic to the lessons uh, that the students love having that direct contact and discussion about the ancient world. Uh, well, Becky, thank you so much for your thoughts. I'm so glad that it's able to provide a really interesting discussion point for you with your students to kick off your explorations together of the ancient world. Um, Tracy Rabiotti has been in touch as well, saying this, that for me, the Q&As have opened the door to a whole new world. From having no idea of what classics was, despite a lifelong fascination, uh, two years on, she feels like Alice in Ancient Wonderland, a third of the way through a classical studies degree at the OU, a member of the Classical Association, and about to head off to the undergraduate course at the British School at Athens. Tracy, we are not at all jealous that you are about to spend several weeks in sunny, sunny Athens, surrounded by Uzo, Suvlaki, Greek yogurt and honey, and going around some of the most amazing sites um, 
in the entirety of the ancient world. But what Tracy also points out, which I think is really lovely, is this, is that she's met so many wonderful people through the Q&A, through the Facebook page, and through the uh, Michael Scott Classical Community page that you guys have um, put together and that you run, um, that has really kind of uh, allowed you to feel part of a whole new world. Hello, Christopher from Melbourne, talking about a whole new world, uh, kind of, here we are, kind of, the Australians are here. Thank you so much, Crystal, for getting up at 2.15 in the morning and tuning in. You are heroic. Um, so Tracy, thank you for that. And that's one of the things I wanted to pick up and thank you all for as well. Which It really is that sense of community that you have created. Um, and for me, kind of, that's one of the major reflections uh, for me thinking about what these Q&As mean is that you have come together, not just to ask your questions, not together, not just for these live Q&As to be part of the discussion, volunteering your thoughts and comments, but that you've been active on the Facebook page and that extraordinary step of you all moving to create the Classics Community page um, that runs alongside it, that you run, you share your interests, you share your destinations and your travels with one another, your questions, your queries. Um, that is absolutely wonderful um, to see. Um, and Latifa Walker has also been in touch with her thoughts um, about the, watching the Q&A. She's got a favorite session, uh, which was when Jess Hughes and I, some time back in 2019, were talking about votives of body parts. And apparently I got quite squirmish um, talking about some of the, uh, the, the genitalia body parts. Um, so thanks, Latifa, for reminding me about that. Um, but also the, the rabbit holes of research, this is how she puts it, uh, that we've got into, um, particularly thinking about the kind of painting of statues, for instance. Yeah, that really stands out for me. Kind of suddenly you go down this enormous rabbit hole facing up to the fact that we don't know so much about the ancient world, but isn't it fun trying to find out what we might uh, might know? And thank you also, Latifa, as well, for the kind of, on a personal note, again, talking about that community um, that this group, uh, the Q&A group and the Facebook page group have, have brought together is absolutely extraordinary and how much you have all drawn from that. I think that is so, so, so important. Um, and then finally, kind of Lynn Baines has also been in touch. She discovered the Q&A, she's a fairly recent Q&A follower only during during the, the latter stages of lockdown in 2021 um, and has been following to only for the last sort of several kind of months, just under a year or so, listened to all of them. She's loved history, um, but during the lockdown became more interested in ancient history. And during that lockdown, when we weren't able to sort of go and do all the things that we could normally go and do, um, Lynn talks about the fact that this was a real kind of gate opener and connector to a world um, that really helped people get through uh, and enjoy the kind of the world of lockdown. Now, Lynn lives in Melbourne. She doesn't kind of off, often uh, attend live because unlike Crystal, she's not quite keen enough to get up at 2.15 in the morning. Um, although she admires the stamina of those that do. Um, but she enjoys knowing that the record Recording is going to be there the next day um, and she feels like kind of she's looking forward to the next 100. Wow well there's a challenge Lynn uh, for the next 100 Q&A's. Um, so thank you so much for you know just reading out some of your thoughts and some of your reflections and what the Q&A's have, have meant to you and I've said in return that really it is the community that's been created that is so special for me. Um, but also just hearing your stories. Um, I love the questions. I love the insights. I love the, the different rabbit holes we end up going down um, and the surprising and really innovative kind of angles that we attack the ancient world through as a result of this. Um, but it's also about hearing your stories. So hearing that uh, kind of this Q&A has sparked you on to a piece of reading. Uh, or owned up a new particular topic in a world that you already liked, but, you know, kind of a new topic has, has caught your attention. Sometimes it's provided that link to people who are stuck on oil platforms, for instance. I've had emails from people who are on oil platforms, stuck, cut, cut away from the world while they're working, but this has provided them with that outlet to a kind of wider cultural world outside while they're kind of uh, literally trapped on a metal platform in the middle of the sea. Um, and uh, kind of uh, uh, other people who have said that it's turned them in a completely new direction in their life um, in order to then go on and do a university degree or an open university degree or to take further study or sometimes even to go back and retake their school studies um, for young uns as well, we've had emails from young uns who have sort of decided to carry on with learning the classical subjects because of um, a kind of engagement with the Q&A and with the Facebook page. And it just, you know, what is lovely is that ability to geek out about the ancient world together. 
not feel alone or embarrassed in any way, shape or form about doing it. And as a result, for us all to be able to engage our passion. And of course, in more recent months, there has also been the chance to have a go at this clock that now stands behind me regularly on Facebook Live Q&As. John, what's up with your clock? You are so behind the times, uh, kind of. We've been there before. It's the way uh, the front facing camera works seemingly on Facebook, that it doesn't translate the, the image around. So you're seeing the clock in reverse. So the time looks like it is in reverse. Yes, time, let's, how about we, we take the clock as a metaphor for time standing still while we do the Q&A. Um, and uh, the lights around it, well, that's a bit of a festive uh, kind of addition that we kind of put uh, on for Christmas this year. And I haven't been bothered to take down because I like the lights. I'm a big fairy light fan. Clive, don't get you started about the clock either. Uh, one day Facebook will uh, invent a clever bit of code so that when you're using the front facing camera, it switches it around the right way and you can have your clock the right way. But there are lovers of the clock out there, Deborah. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, kind of who doesn't like an inverted clock in one way or another. Now, we have been going on for quite some time talking about the fact that this is the 100th Q&A starting back in August 20. 18. We've answered over 550 questions live on this Q&A that you guys have all come up with. Um, we've had 38 prize winners. John, you forgot. <laughs> we kind of, you won't forget now, will you, about the clock? Um, kind of, we've had over 38 prize winners and people have been coming in from countries all around the world um, to listen in and partake and be part of the community. And all I would like to say to you is long may that continue, that you are part of that community on the Facebook page and on the Classics community page and geeking out with some of these live Q and A's. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. Now, we have had a whole series of new great questions in, um, uh, as it kind of exemplifies the spirit, of course, of the 100th Q&A. Um, and there are lots, uh, we've got about five minutes or so um, that we can deal with a few of those those great, great questions. Now, I did promise last time that Leanne Wemben Price, we would answer this one that was hanging over from last time, um, which was she's been introducing her 10 year old to Ray Harryhausen's stop motion work, um, and particularly the 1981 version of Clash of the Titans. Um, and I wanted to know if there's anything Greek mythology that you would like to have seen given the Harryhausen treatment. So some of you, if, if you don't know Harryhausen's work, just Google Harryhausen's stop motion work. Absolutely extraordinary ways of getting uh, creatures before animation, before kind of the ability to do any kind of clever virtual digital kind of creations of particularly dinosaurs, which is where Harryhausen started. Uh, kind of there he was getting dinosaurs moving around in great clash dinosaur movies. And there were lots of those that he made. But then he also turned his attention to the world of ancient myth. Um, clash of the Titans is the one that Leanne has been watching. But probably I would have thought the most famous or the most famous scene, at least, that we all sort of have seen at one point or another, although we might not realise that it's Harry Housen's work, is his Jason and the Argonauts um, movie, in which there's that great scene in which the skeletons are all animated fighting the individual human warriors. Um, so the stop motion work was able to actually pair those pictures uh, in some incredible early days of the technology uh, of being able to say, like kind of having human fighters actually fighting against skeletons. And if you Google that scene, Jason and the Argonauts, Harry House and Skeletons, um, you'll see the scene, you'll see the intricacy of it, and you'll be able to understand that uh, it was four months of work uh, to, uh, by the production team to be able to actually uh, kind of uh, get that scene live um, on camera for Jason and the Argonauts. So an extraordinary set of work. So do do check out Ray Harryhausen's. Now, are there any stories from Greek mythology that we haven't had given the treatment of so far? Um, I think an odyssey. I mean, surely, I don't think an odyssey was amongst his work. Uh, but I think an Odyssey would be absolutely fabulous, wouldn't it? Like kind of you can imagine all the amazing monsters that he could bring to life um, through the stop motion style. Uh, I think that, that would be brilliant. So my uh, vote would be for an Odyssey. Uh, then we've uh, kind of had Christos has asked a question. Is there anything about antiquity that you still have questions about? Um, absolutely. Yes, Christos, kind of, as you said, that's the joy of this, isn't it? We can never stop answering questions. In fact, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was giving a paper in a conference at Warwick where we were thinking about the experience of ancient festivals. Um, and I was thinking about a festival that, you know, is well known uh, in the ancient world, the Panathenaic Festival. So that big celebration of Athens where they basically geeked out about 
how amazing Athens was at the same time as worshipping Athena and bringing a new robe to put on her statue. Um, but uh, what was interesting to me was that when you get into kind of looking at the at the sort of small groups that were uh, asked to make up the beginning of the official religious procession uh, that goes from the Keramikos, from the graveyard, from outside the walls of the city, through the city, then up the Acropolis, onto the Acropolis to, to bring the, the robe to the statue of Athena and then to sacrifice loads and loads of cows to her. Those groups actually start to look very, very odd. They're groups composed of um, a small group of women who are on the edge of marriage, who are from the elite aristocratic families of Athens. And for them, it's basically a bit of a marriage parade. It's their chance to kind of catch the eye of a future husband. Then it's followed by a group of emetic, so resident foreigner girls, who are forced to carry parasols and stools for these marriage, marriageable elite aristocrats. Then it's a group of young, young girls, seven to 11 year olds, who have been living on the Acropolis for eight months, weaving the helping and overseeing weaving the robe for Athena must have been terrified out of their lives to suddenly be confronted with an enormous crowd of the whole of Athens and all the allies of Athens gathered to watch this procession when women didn't get much time outside of the house particularly at that young age then it was followed by a group of metic men who had to walk in the procession and they did so supposedly in silence, uh, kind of just uh, uh, they were marked out in special clothes to show that they were different from everyone else. Then there was a group of old Athenian men carrying branches totally bizarre and all of these people came before uh, kind of any of the normal groups you might expect of democratic Athens i.e the democratic elected officials the actual citizen normal citizens of Athens the allies etc 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 so what I was suddenly struck by the fact that the whole head of this Panathenaic procession that was so central and important to Athens all of these individual groups probably weren't having a very nice time being in this procession at all and it struck me that although this procession was supposed to um, demonstrate the great that was Athens to the wider world. Actually, the people that were in the procession having to do that demonstration may not have been having a very nice time at all. Um, so lots are kind of still exciting and interesting me about the ancient world crystals. Thanks so much for your question. Um, Latifa asked, what inspired you to start up the Q&As? Interaction with you all. There you go, Latifa. Very, very kind. An ability to actually have a two-way conversation backwards and forwards through the medium of the digital, the video, with your questions coming in, answers coming back, but also live discussion. That's what we miss. It's not a one-way street. It should be a two-way discursive street, and that's what we wanted um, to get out of this. Uh, we've had a question in, I think this is a great way to finish up, from Patricia Dugdale as well. Did the ancient civilizations enjoy cake? Now, Patricia, this is a question that I can get on board with. And this is the kind of question that epitomises what this Q&A is about. Who's going to ask that question but us here on this Q&A? Did they enjoy cake? Yes, they did. Um, so the ancient Greeks, we know they made a, a cake that, that they would eat themselves called placus, which was a flat thing made with eggs, milk, honey. So it's kind of nuts. It's kind of like baklava, I guess, uh, kind of would be uh, sort of the modern equivalent. Um, but then the Romans also made a cake that did have some flour in it flour, honey, cheese they added in as well. Cheese, kind of, I'm not quite sure about a cheesecake thing, but, but you know, they kind of, the Romans were all for it. And actually there were cakes used for, for both human consumption. Uh, so, and, and, and we'll come back to what they would, when they would have cake, but also cake, special cakes were made for, as a sacrifice to the gods. So yes, of course, you could do your big sacrifice of cutting the throat of an animal and burning the animal to the gods, etc. in the Greek and the Roman world, but smaller, more individual sacrifices were made with honeyed cakes of one form or another that you could put on the altar and leave for the gods, particularly if you couldn't afford a whole animal to be sacrificed. Uh, Carol says, the cheese scone. Yes, that is an excellent way of thinking about it. I hate cheese scones, um, but, you know, apparently the Romans were all over their cheese scones. Nice job, Carol. Um, but if you weren't making a cake for the gods, if you wanted to make a cake for humans uh, kind of to celebrate, when did you do it? For the birthday party. Yes, yes. The Romans in particular had cakes for birthday parties. Um, and we know this because Ovid spends a bit of time complaining about the fact that it's not a good birthday if you don't get a cake. And I completely and utterly agree with him. So on that note, on the note that we should all eat cake as much as possible, 
and that the ancients were doing it and thus it must be a good idea to do. And on the note of such a question which is so brilliantly kind of uh, engineered to really shine a light on what this Q&A does, we're going to bring this 100th Q&A to a close. Thank you so much much as always for joining in today and for every one of the sessions. Thank you for every one of not just the 550 plus questions we've managed to answer but for every question you've sent in. Congratulations to all our prize winners. Congratulations to of course today's prize winner as well, um, Stephanie Kirk and thank you for all of your thoughts and reflections on what the Q&A means to you um, and here long long live uh, the kind of the community that we have created here. So I am leaving you with Tom Scott's words. So on last week's Q&A, there was a mention of the musical version of Antigone. Uh, and you've been obsessed with it, Tom, all day. So he started to write a libretto and he just wanted to let us all know how it's going. Here is what he's come up with so far. I'm getting buried in the morning. Hymoan is surely going to pine. Then Creon will find no solace because he's sending me to the necropolis and Eurydice's the next in line. Tom, love it. We want to hear more. We want to see this on the West End stage. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you all so much indeed. Have a fabulous, fabulous uh, rest of the day and of the week and of the rest of the summer to come. We will be back next time in a little while, a couple of weeks, 25th of August, 5pm. 25th of August, 5pm. I will see you all then and we look forward to it. Take care in the meantime, eat cake and be happy. Take care all.